This podcast is a member of the Place to Be Nation family. Visit us at placetobenation.com, the only place to be in your pop culture world. This is It Was a Thing on TV. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the dregs of humanity. Episode 153, Submission 1950, TKO. TKO was a series of a week of unsold pilots produced by Mark Goodson Productions for ABC in 1989. Meet Andrea Michaels, an English teacher from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Nathan Walpole. A computer analyst from Brooklyn, New York. And Eve Greenfield, a novelist from Venice, California. These three players will compete all this week on... T-K-O! And here's the star of our show, Peter Tomarkin! Hi, thank you, everyone. Welcome to TKO, a game of survival. Hey, guys. Here's an idea for you. Let's take Jeopardy and cross-pollinate it with blockbusters. The kids will love it. It could work. That was basically the pitch behind TKO. But, oh, wait. It's not just Jeopardy meets Blockbusters, or Blockbusters meets Jeopardy. There's a bit of the countdown round on Split Second as well. There's even some other shows, but I think we'll talk about that uh, later on in this episode. Uh, the first thing I think we should mention before anything else, that theme music. Oh, God. That theme music is poptastic. It's, uh, it's shag terrific. It's well, poptastic. Well, it hits, as the kids would say. Well, you know what else that's from? What else is that from? A little show that aired on WGN Nationwide uh, about 25, 30 years ago. Illinois Instant Riches. Uh, Oh, yeah. His son worked on that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a little family ties there. But yeah, that's the first thing that came to mind is, oh my gosh, that's the Illinois Instant Riches theme, and I haven't seen that show in probably 25 years. Oh, and I would also add Illinois Instant Riches. Probably, for your money, one of the two or three best lottery shows there's ever been. Yep. That's not saying much, but... Yeah, let's just say there are... When you think of lottery shows that have a national presence, one of them is Illinois Instant Riches, the other, The Big Spin. And the Powerball show from 20 years ago. Yeah. But yeah, let's get back to TKO. This if I'm not mistaken, was the last original format by Mark Goodson. Yeah, in fact, Mark Goodson would actually die three years later. A lot of it was designed to be timeless, but at the same time, very current. You look at that set, and that just screams very uh, late 80s, early 90s, retro future, I guess you could say. And indicative of the late 80s, Everything was big in the 80s, and uh-huh. that was big. There was a big T and a big K and a big O. Just in case you forgot what the name of the show was. And it hasn't escaped notice that it bears resemblance to another show whose logo was prominent in the background airing in 1989. Does this look like anything to you? Are you talking about Jeopardy? Yes, I'm talking about Jeopardy. Nah, okay, I can buy that a little bit. But it seems like TKO was very derivative of many different things. Not just the big letters of Jeopardy. Oh, but did the big uh, letters in Jeopardy move? Did they rotate like the TKO letters? Nope. No. Nope. nope. No. Gotta give Goodson the uh, advantage there. His letters moved. They um, moved. Yeah. They were very mobile. They were very colorful, too. It wasn't just neon or or fluorescent lights. They, they were multiple colors. They, they were very 
It's like decked out. Th- they were very green with a uh, white stripe and black polka dots. Yeah, with another red stripe. Again, very eighties, early nineties ish. Especially with the uh, way that everything's set up, you have the game board on stage right, and the player area on stage left, and they both have these crazy patterns to them, and the floor as well. Very crazy pattern. Very uh, loud pattern there. Very colorful, yes. Well, we've talked enough about the set. And the theme uh, music. And we've talked about the theme music. Uh, I think we should get into the actual game and uh, into who hosted this. And who hosted this, this person I don't think ever did any Goodson game show. No. Nope. No, so th- I, I don't even think he's done any pilots for Goodson or did any pilots for Goodson. Nope. No, and we're talking about the, the one and only Peter Tamarkin. Yeah, Press Your Luck would have been purchased by Pearson, not Goodson Totten. Pe- no, no, Press Your Luck wasn't purchased until, like, way later. I know. Yeah, but th- there's still no relevance. I get what Chico's going after, yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're talking about the same uh, Peter Tamarkin who hosted Press Your Luck, and... He would have just been coming off of probably Wipeout at this time. Yeah, the 1988 version of Wipeout. Mm-hmm. And obviously this was probably a good five years before he did any work for Game Show Network. Because that wouldn't have been until late 94, so we're talking yeah. well over five years, uh, most likely. Yep. And of course, he's hosted shows that we're going to cover at some point. I think we're looking at... We're two years away from talking about Hitman. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, January 2023, we'll definitely be talking about Hitman. Yeah, totally. we're going we're, we're to talk about the 40th anniversary of January 3rd, 1983. Big a very, date in game show history. A very historic day. There, there's at least four things we need to talk about that happened that day. Yeah, uh, that, we, that, we're just going to make a whole month out of that. We, we, we can make a whole month out of a day. But no, honestly, we could talk about four different things. And, and honestly, they have four different impacts uh, on the uh, the game show uh, world uh, in game show history. But also, I'm sure we're going to talk at some point about paranoia. We well, could have talked about it because it was one of those millionaire ripoffs. It was a millionaire ripoff. It was Family Channel's attempt at a millionaire ripoff. But at the same time, it was live and interactive and game shows without a net yeah this was fox family at that time yes and mike you have a story about paranoia i was gonna say the only thing the only addition i was gonna add to what you guys have said was i got a computer on the premiere i got a computer on the final episode oh look at that we're bookends i didn't get anything because i was 16 at the time (laughs) greg got a rock what did your dad get (laughs) Right, could you imagine my dad watching Paranoia wondering why there's not a halftime show? Why isn't there a halftime show on Paranoia? Why aren't they playing above a lake? Hey, when you really think about it, Paranoia was ahead of its time. With the whole interactive stuff, with people being located in different parts, like on a teleconference call. Think about it. Yeah, you're, you're not... Well, uh-huh. it wasn't, but the thing is... Now, Chico didn't get this part of it. I did because I actually applied for the show. And also, even though I won a computer, I think I screwed up the the following morning because they they said, we'll call contestants who won computers. You could be a contestant on the show. They called it like seven in the morning. It's like, I'm not waking up at seven in the morning to take a phone call. Then it hit me. Oh, that might have been paranoia. And I just didn't call them. And also at the same point, they never called me back. So whoops maybe i don't know it wasn't teleconferencing in the way that we're used to nowadays like zoom what like they actually the did right now yeah, yeah well what they actually did was it was actually on location they have a camera crew in your house or wherever you're being recorded and so imagine the expense of that getting the whole camera crew and, uh, to however many different locations you use on any episode, eight, 12. Yeah, I, they've usually played at least two games per, uh, per day, per show. That's not inexpensive. And again, this is many, many years before we had Zoom and 
Skype and, and stuff like that. Yeah, but we'll talk about more about that when we get to Paranoia. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we have this beautiful TKO we need to yeah. talk about. Yeah. 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 This beautiful, loud, incredibly wonderful thing that never got out of pilot stage. Yeah, unfortunately. This was a good show. It really was. It was it, very it, engaging. It was. I think just unfortunately, it, it may have not been a good game for a morning audience. Yeah. Because what, what you need to remember is there were at least four game shows that ABC was looking at picking up at that time. We have obviously TKO, which is going to be your blockbusters, Q&A, Jeopardy, hybrid kind of sort of show. And then you had Body Talk with Vicki Lawrence, which was your body language type of show, your, 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 your charades, acting out and stuff like that. And then the third one that you had was Gambit, which was hosted by Bob Eubanks. And I mean, Gambit is timeless. And uh, the pilot in 1990 was very well done. Um, kind of a surprise that didn't get picked up. But the one show that made it out of those four was, and maybe this is based on name only, maybe it was based on host, even though Big Honk and Asterisk the person who hosted the pilot didn't host the regular series because uh, of illness and I think death uh, before the show's run ended. Uh, we're talking about Match Game with Bert Convy hosting. Yeah. And I love Bert, but unfortunately, when you watch that, he didn't look all that well at the time. No. No. Yeah. So I don't know if it was a pity thing or maybe Goodson got an ultimatum from ABC. We love the show, but we need to have a host who is healthy or who at least can host the show for 13, 26, 52 weeks, what have you. And that's where they got Ross Schaefer. Who no. wouldn't have been doing much at the time. No, he, he would not have been doing Love Me, Love Me Not at that time. He may have just been doing, what What would he have been doing? He wasn't doing the Late Late <laughs> Show at that point, I don't believe. Yeah, because yeah, it was no. already done by that point. Yeah, it was on, way past done. Yeah, we're talking about the Late Show version on Fox. Right. So, yeah, he was available, and I thought what uh, appeared on 1990 for Match Game was superb. Yeah. I, it, was, it was really the, the, well, it wasn't the first version that I got exposure to because of the little show called Match Game of Hollywood Squares. But, hey, there's our Match Game Hollywood Squares reference for this episode. Yeah. Mark that off your bingo card. <laughs> but uh, it was my real the first experience that I, I could appreciate because match game Hollywood squares as an eight or nine year old, a lot of the little, the jokes sort of go over your head. They're a little too subtle for a, a, an eight or nine year old, but when you're at the age of 15 or 16, oh, that's yeah. like the sweet spot. You're, you're, you've got that adult thinking, you've got that sort of um, the, the double entendre thinking in your mind. So it's like, okay, now I can appreciate this. Now this isn't just about my stupid ass fascination of Nidra Voles. Yeah. Well, hopefully one day Buzzer will air Match Game ninety on there. Oh, oh yeah. And, and and GSN aired it about twenty years ago, so it isn't like it's been sitting in a vault for uh, thirty years untouched. Yeah, it's a great version of Match Game. It's and a really I, good version. I liked it. It it, it was a a. Uh, not a, it was a respectable a version. It was a respectable version. Uh, it was a very solid reboot that unfortunately came at the wrong time, both in terms of 1990 when game shows were on the decline, but also it aired at least here uh, or in the Akron area, because it didn't air in Cleveland. It aired at noon, and that's not a good time slot. That was the network call that the show was going to air at noon. Yeah, so I think here it would have aired against like... The 44th occupant of the White House card. Yes. Mr. Wink, Black. Wink, wink. Yes, Mr. Black. But any We never got Mr. Black card either. So, But uh, anywho, getting back to uh, uh, TKO, which didn't get picked up. Yeah, we haven't even talked about how the game worked. So we talked about the set, the music. We talked about Peter Tamarkin. We talked about Mark Goodson. We talked about ABC. The only thing we haven't talked about was... 
how the game worked, and all we did was give passing references to Blockbusters, Jeopardy, and Split Second, among others. So uh, the game itself, as we've mentioned throughout the show, it was a week-long affair, or that's what it would it was the big selling point. It wasn't, okay, you're on for one show, champ comes back, everybody else goes home. You're on for five shows, which, honestly, there's two ways of looking at it. Everybody should hopefully walk away with some money at some point that week, or somebody could walk away with a lot of money if they win four or five days. So there's two different uh, theories there, two different trains of thought as to benefits or advantages uh, of playing for the entire week. So you had three people on for the entire week, and the game itself, and, and using a phrase that Chico enjoys, does this remind you of anything? Does this remind you of anything? The game board to start is three columns across and five rows down, a.k.a. half a Jeopardy board. Ah, I didn't think of that. Yes, since the Jeopardy board is six uh, columns, five rows, this is half of it. And, of course, the uh, questions range from $100 to $500 in value. Hey, Chico, mm-hmm. does that remind you of anything? It reminds me of something. Okay, I, I, I just wanted to verify. Now, one other show that Chico didn't mention that this reminds me of is Trivia Trap. Oh, yes. Oh, well, Trivia Trap, which we covered earlier this year. Yep. Yeah. So the, the where Trivia Trap comes into play is... If you've ever seen the final round, not not the the bonus round, but the round, the race to $1,000. So in each of the rows, there was sort of like the the trivia race. There was a category, a one word category shown that gave you a hint as to what the question's about. So Mm -hmm. it could be like Disney. It could be music. It could be Prince. It could, like I said, examples that were on the show, Monopoly was used and uh, Playtex was used. And if you know what Playtex is, you know the only thing they're really known for. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> cross your heart, bra. But uh, so, so they gave you those, uh, th- those uh, hints as to what the question's about. And again, does this remind you of anything? The values went from 100 at the top down to 500 at the bottom. There was one catch, though. You couldn't do the, uh, the whole tower leaping around or, or whatever you want to call it. You had to go from top to bottom. So you had to play the hundreds first. Then you had uh, in that same column, play the 200. No, well, you didn't have to stay at the same column, but when you played a question in a column, you had to go 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. I'm guessing the technology didn't exist at the time for Goodson to jump around the board or they were making it as a strategic point. Uh, or they just didn't want to flat out copy Jeopardy. Yeah. I, I mean, they, they, they had to make it a little different Again, you, you don't want to infringe on the rules too much. Yeah, 100 to 500, you, you can't really copyright uh, or, uh, or trademark dollar values. But you want your game to be a little different, enough where it doesn't bring a lawsuit. Even though Merv and Mark Goodson have more money than God. Not to mention that they're both really good friends. Yeah. Uh, so th- th- yeah, there may have been some liberties there. They, they may have... Uh, had a good working relationship. And for all we know, Mark Goodson may have run by, uh, may have run this by Merv saying, Hey, I'm going to be using this game board, which is half the size of the Jeopardy game board, but it's not Jeopardy. We're going to use this same dollar value structure. You know, are y'all cool with that? Who knows? Incidentally on the one aired TKO pilot, there is a question about Merv Griffin on it which lends some credence to Mike's theory about Mark giving the blessing to Merv for the AOK of this show, which will apply right here. Merv for $300. What financially troubled casino corporation is owned by Merv Griffin? Andrea? R.I. And that stands for? Resorts International. Yes, and you're not in trouble because you're moved into the lead and you have the board. Uh, Maybe that's another reason it didn't make it. Maybe... Possibly ABC saw too much Jeopardy in this, too many similarities, where viewers are going to say, hey, Jeopardy has those dollar values. Hey, Jeopardy's got a board like that just 
twice as big. And, and, and especially considering a lot of ABC affiliates air Jeopardy also. Yeah. Especially at that time. Oh, yes. It's been three or four years since they canceled the, the one-two punch of Joker's Wild and Tic-Tac-Toe. How are we going to build off of this? Or we're just Wait gonna a year. Build? Wait a year. Oh, that's not a good idea, Mike. I know it's not. <laughs> Patience, my son. <laughs> oh, although, I believe this stuff. Although I'm going to get into a rant about why I'm probably like one of five people that like the 90 version of Joker's Wild. Okay, I'm going to pencil that in for later. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so as we were saying, uh, so, so the questions themselves, again, we, we mentioned the categories. We mentioned how you played down the board. You can't pick and choose what you want. Before the question is shown, you're given three sets of initials or three sets of, of letters. And one of those three sets of letters are the initials or the initial to the answer to the question. And you don't identify by saying the name of the answer. You say L-L-A-P. Okay, okay. now that you said L-L-A-P, if that's correct, then you can give your answer. Live long and prosper. Let's just say, for example. Yeah. We missed it, Nimoy. Oh, I'm sorry. R.I.P. Leonard. Peace and long life. Anyway. So if the, per- the first person to buzz in, if they give the right set of uh, initials, they can answer the question. If they're right, they get that money added to the bank. Nice and simple. If they're wrong, they lose that money. Boy, where, what does that sound like? Uh, does this remind you of anything? But the one difference, there, there aren't daily doubles in this. There's actually knockout questions. Now, what is a knockout question, Mike? It's, uh, believe it or not, it sounds like a daily double because only the person who picked it can play it. But what the uh, big thing about that is, is if they're correct, they can knock the value of that question off of somebody else's bank. So it's a strategic point. You know, if you have like a $500 knockout question, do you want to knock out the person who's got only $500 to their uh, bank? Or would you rather attack the high scorer who's got, let's say, $2,000? So it's, it's a strategic piece uh, more than the, the daily double where you say, I'm going to make it a true daily double. Let's double up and, you know, get the lead or whatnot. Here, you're, you're actually taking away from your opponents more than you are benefiting yourself. I see that. But you also get the value of the question if you're right. So, actually, so you're basically uh, taking from your opponent. Well, you, you're gaining for yourself, but you're also taking away, you're weakening an opponent. Right. So yeah, you've got that dual implication there. And, uh, and that really could change a game, especially, again, if it's a big value question. If it's worth $1,000, if you gain 1000 and then can knock an opponent down by a thousand. You could change the lead. You could change who has the advantage going into the final round. It, it there's some strategy involved. It's just a different type of beast than than Jeopardy. And no, you don't have to answer in the form of a question. You just need to answer in the form of initials, then give the response. So you have those fifteen questions. You play the fifteen questions, and we should mention there's two knockout questions in each round. So you play the fifteen questions like any other show then you do it all over again with the second round and again does this sound like anything familiar the values are doubled from 200 to a thousand yeah oh does that sound like anything from jeopardy i don't does this sound like any you know it just well, you know, it, well just... it is but the thing is we haven't used those values in in 20 years but yeah it, it's it's like does this sound like anything yeah it sounds just like how jeopardy is it sets up its board so after two rounds Here's where I think it gets really fascinating. And the final round isn't like a wagering round a la Final Jeopardy or other TV shows. It's a game of survival. Yep. And this incorporates some stuff we've seen in other shows. Yeah, there's a little bit of countdown around here from Split Second. The two shows that really came to mind when I first saw this one is the top secret pilot, which uh, Wink which Mark also shot in 1989, if I'm not mistaken. No, 88. It, it was shot on my it was shot on my birthday in 88. Easy way to remember that. That's going to be covered later. But the other show it reminded me of, and this would have been on the air around 
88, 89. So this would have been contemporary. If you guys remember the show, and this is another entry we're going to talk about eventually, Couch Potatoes. Ooh. If you remember the final round of Couch Potatoes where you had one person on each team going head to head and there was a randomizer flipping through values, that's sort of what this was like. You, you had values that were, I, I believe it ranged from 500 to $1,000 and it got into some pretty interesting increments. I think it was, uh, it, uh, I don't know if, if the, uh, the randomizer had 20 values, but given they had a lot of values that were $625, $825, $775, I would assume that the randomizer would have 20 values or 21 values, all the values from $500 to $1,000 in $25 increments. Because it wasn't just flat up 500, 550, 600, 650, 700, 750, 800, 850, 900, 950, 1000 you had odd values like 525 and 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 675 and 925 so not, not that that makes much of a difference in terms of gameplay but you had that type of randomizer where it just flipped through values about four values every second and once you buzzed in just like again top secret or couch potatoes you locked into that value and if you were right what you got to do was knock out that much money from one of your opponents. Again, strategery involved. Do you go after the person who's in the lead or do you go after the person, not you, who's closest to losing all their money? Getting your TKO. Ha, there's, there's where the name came from. You TKO'd your player by getting rid of all their money. I knew that previously, but I just wanted to to throw that out there for our our listeners. The game ended once two people were knocked out, once they got TKO'd, once they lost all their money through this process of questions and then hitting the randomizer and, and stopping at mystery values. So the person who had money left over, they won that day, but they also got a $5,000 bonus. So, so if you, again, if you think about it, if you stay on for five days and win five days, you're guaranteed at least, I'm going to presume $25,125. Because if you have $25, you win the game. You, you did not go down to zero. So conceivably, you could win $25 every day and you get that $5,000 bonus. So obviously, if you stayed on five days and won all five days, you should probably win closer to thirty or $40,000. But again, for, for yeah, if you're a five-time winner, you're guaranteed twenty-five thousand one hundred twenty-five dollars. Yeah, and, and really, that was pretty much your game. You, you had a. Mm, I, I'm going to say this term very carefully. You had a single TKO. You had a double TKO, and then your your final round was your final TKO. Boy, does that sound like something! I'm not saying it again, Mike. I don't expect you to say it, but again, we're, we're seeing similarities. We're seeing patterns here. We're seeing familiarity. And that's probably going to be the answer to why this didn't get picked up is because <sighs> does this look like anything? Yeah. I, I, I think we mentioned that earlier. It, it probably didn't get picked up because it looks too much like Jeopardy at the time when most ABC affiliates were airing Jeopardy at 7.30 at night. Hold up. Wait, Hold no, up. No, 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 no. No, ABC no, 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 no. Aired seven Jeopardy o'clock. at 7. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. You guys are wrong. It aired here at 7.30. Yeah, because oh. you're not an ABC O and O. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's like, you've got this flyover ABC crap who thinks they can get away with airing Jeopardy at 7.30. Yeah. Maybe in Red State land it's cool to air jeopardy at 7 30 but no not on the east coast son wait a second where do i live i live awfully close to the east coast no ohio's midwest technically isn't it uh, oh don't get me started on that argument because we've actually had that argument at work oh boy uh, well i'm like six hours away from the ocean so is that really midwest hmm <laughs> Yeah, I, I, got my, my, I got my eye on you, man. I, I, I'm making my compelling argument. Yes, 
I'm cutting my eye on you, man. Oh, if you really want to get in this red state argument, do I need to remind you, like, the entire state of Mississippi airs Jeopardy at, like, 11 in the morning? Oh, hell no! Hell no! Why? Why would you do that? Because it's Mississippi. They don't treasure things like education and book smarts. And if anyone in Mississippi is listening, we're really sorry. I really think that, yes, it could have worked, but maybe if it didn't look so much like other shows. And I know that Blockbusters was within the the Goodson family or Goodson Todman family, but there were other ways of doing it, I think. I don't know. Yeah. It, it makes me yearn for more body talk with Vicki Lawrence, I think. I don't know. Oh, wow. I enjoyed that show. Well, it was a good show. Vicki Lawrence, well, Lawrence is a good host. Vicki Lawrence is a good host. And it had Bill Kirkenbauer, for heaven's sakes. Who doesn't love Bill Kirkenbauer? I'll tell you who doesn't like Bill Kirkenbauer. People who don't appreciate a good sense of timing and a good sense of humor. Just saying, just the ten of us. Great show. Right? Just putting that out there. Launched Jamie Lunar's career, ladies and gentlemen. Well, well, plus also it was a spinoff of Growing Pains, and anything that helps Alan Thicke is always good in my book. So unless anybody has anything to add, that's TKO. Perhaps one of the lasting legacies of TKO, this is something that we haven't covered yet, but one of the lasting legacies of TKO was the entry shot. Because, you know, shows like this, they don't have an opening sequence. They have an entry shot. And in the entry shot, they theoretically introduce the three contestants for the week. One of them is Mark Goodson. Mark Goodson holding a cup of coffee. What we're going to say is a cup of coffee. Why they included this in the pilot, I have no idea. Nobody knows. And by the way, this did air on Buzzer in 2015 as part of their Lost in Fun Week special. Yes. And to this day, we still don't know why Mark Goodson was having a drink on set. Some mysteries will never be answered. It's one of those shows that you thought it could work. You really did. Because I watched it, and I enjoyed it. I fully enjoyed it. And I thought it could work. Unfortunately, I can see why nobody decided to pick it up, because of the obvious. Well, guys, um, I got one thing to add, and no, it's not eBay Price is Right. I I think it's time to to visit the It Was a Thing on TV haiku corner. Well, well, Greg, you made it sound like you have a haiku, too. I think we're going to do a haiku battle. Yeah, all right. Oh, oh, this is new, a haiku battle. And I'm going to be the one to... uh, ultimately decide who wins it you're going to that's exactly what your role is going to be yeah this is on par of epic rap battles of history so uh, remember we are the originators of the haiku battle if anybody tell you any different they're telling you dead ass wrong all right greg do you have your haiku ready yeah all right good since tko pilot How did ABC react to this show? Daytime said, TK, oh no. Wait, that's not a haiku. You had six syllables in the last line. Yeah. It counted counted it as five. Then obviously you need to uh, go to the uh, algorithm and tell it where to go. It's a suck it, but okay. It's a, it's a Greg Dieter haiku. It's a Greg Dieter haiku special. I do things different. Five, seven, and six. <laughs> you, 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 the thing of it is, you could have just said, TK, no. No, yeah, exactly. Well, you got 18 syllables for the price of 17. Damn right. And, and, and sadly, mine is very similar to Greg's. Oh, gosh. Here we go. Goodson's TKO. 1989, it's a no. It's TKO no. <laughs> Again, it was very similar to what you had. Uh, d- just the d- difference is the, the middle section. I yeah. think I should win by default because I use 17 syllables. I cannot disagree with that logic. Wait a minute. 
It was supposed to be 17 syllables, Mike. I, I, I used Where's 17 the... syllables. Okay, you said 16. Well, I, I, I was uh, overcompensating for Greg wait, having one wait, too many. Wait, you had 16. I had 18. So Deaver's a proper high school. I had 17. I had 17. I just said I had 16. I gave you 17. Go back, rewind the tape, listen to it. I never, I never said that. Uh, I never said that. So who's the victor, Chico? I have to give it to Mike because he did have 17 syllables. Greg, better luck next time. I'm sure you have. I'm sure you. I know you have a good haiku for our next subject. Wow! Hey, Greg, I have a haiku. Oh, really? Oh, no! Oh, no! Mine right. is better because wait, of the well, punchline. Hold, hold on, hold on. Bad TV movie. Glug, 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 glug. Too many deck chairs. And that's my preview of the next episode of It Was a Thing on TV. Cluck, <laughs> The Mighty Ducks are playing for the World Championship. But their competition... <laughs> isn't playing fair. TV USA is going down. No, it's more than just a game. It's personal. Beat them good. Real good. And Emilio Estevez. Yeah! Yeah! P2, the Mighty Ducks are back. Rated PG. Starts Friday, March 25th at a theater near you. Craft macaroni and cheese. It's a cheesy ceremony. Let's eat ready and roll on it. While see Rex does the limbo. <laughs> That's crap cheesy macaroni. Cause when the cheese starts flowing, it's your turn to go. So take a cheesy locomoni. <laughs> to a good time near a thony. So to bring your pepperoni. Hip, hip, pepperoni. Cause when the cheese starts flowing, Rex gets your noodle going. Want to play ball with the pros? Then tackle the Fox Kids NFL Game Day 2002 sweepstakes. Win and you'll get your own PlayStation game console and NFL Game Day 2002 video game. Then we'll send you to the NFL Pro Bowl in Hawaii to try your game day moves against a real NFL player. 1,000 others win an NFL Game Day 2002 video game for PlayStation. To enter, send us your name and address by October 5th to Fox Kids NFL Game Day 2002, P.O. Box 4030, Beverly Hills 90213. Weekday afternoons, Fox Kids puts you in. We're taking you in. In for Power Rangers Time Force. In for Transformers Robots in Disguise. And in for Digimon. Yeah! Fox Kids, now on from 2 p.m. till 4 p.m. Weekday afternoons. You in? Oh, yeah! Check out these hot new WWF figures. Unleash the lightning power of the tornado. Sheer power of the barber. And the firepower sergeant slaughter. Perfectly ridiculous. With Mr. Perfect, you can achieve perfection. Wrong! Cause these WWF figures have the power of Hulkamania. Quickness, Coco beware. Pounding boards of the hammer. New WWF figures. <laughs> Perfect. New WWF figures got the power. Power, WWF. Figures sold separately. Perfect. Perfect. Weekdays, it's an exciting challenge of a lifetime for big cash and prizes with Press Your Luck, the game where any contestant can win a mint $4,000 or chance to lose it all. Join host Peter Tamark in weekdays and dare to press your luck. <laughs> Familiar crack of polished wood against taut horse side can only mean one thing. It's baseball season. And when the umpire shouts, play ball, you got to make sure you have enough energy to go the full nine. That's why between innings, I fuel up with a snack that's easy and quick. Mr. Larry's Toast on a Stick. The distinctive crust makes a hit in any league. But don't take my word for it. Look for yourself. These dark tones. Indicate real toast. Mmm. So batter up with a snack that's the champion's pick. Mr. Larry's Toast on a Stick. It's toast terrific. <laughs> Back to the show. 
episode 154, submission 1651, SOS Titanic. SOS Titanic was a made-for that aired on ABC the night of September 23rd, 1979. That's as much as we can do without being sued. And I like how Zoom said, are you playing music? Oh, it did? (laughs) It did. (laughs) Oh, that's hilarious. I would be lucky if my Zoom did that. So this day in history, April 15th, 1912, in the icy waters of the North Atlantic, the RMS Titanic, the crown jewel of the White Star Line ran into an iceberg and stuck its whole ass up in the air. Yep. Right before it broke into three separate pieces and fell to the bottom of the Atlantic where it rests to... No, it was three. It was two. It was three. Oh, I didn't realize it was three. Oh, yeah, it was three. I thought it was just the... the it broke in two... But did another piece break off when it was descending in the ocean? Yes. Okay. But yes. Uh, the Titanic ran into an iceberg, did, 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 like little divorce code, and it was built to withstand four bulkheads being flooded. The bitch took out five. A big ass gash. And it's like, this boat's sinking. Let's get the hell off this boat. Eh, no, it's not sinking. It'll be fine. It's clear. I swear. You steerage folk are all crazy. But, of course, there have been many movies about the Titanic over the years. And one Broadway musical. One Broadway musical. A Tony Award winning Broadway musical. But arguably, I think two of the most famous movies about the Titanic are 1958's A Night to Remember. And, of course... The James Cameron-directed version of Titanic from 1997. Which had the record for the largest gross for a movie until a couple of movies in the 2000s came along. Like, I don't know. Well, James Cameron broke it. Avatar. Yeah, James Cameron broke it with Avatar. Then the Avengers Endgame. Then back to Avatar. Yeah. Well, in between, though, in between A Night to Remember and the 1987 Titanic, we had this movie. SOS Titanic, which was released theatrically in Britain by EMI Films. But in America, it aired on ABC, baby. And then... Iceberg right ahead! She's sinking. They said she'd last forever. She's never been seen since. SOS Titanic. Sunday. That star-studded ABC season of 1979. Yeah. And not only that, but considering ABC was known for airing long-ass versions of movies, this version of SOS Titanic that aired on ABC aired a good 40 minutes longer than the theatrical cut. Yep. And not only that, it has... An alternate opening. It had an alternate opening that you will only see in the TV release, which was never aired in syndication in many markets where people still aired movies in syndication. So we have the wireless operator, Harold Cottom, played by Christopher Strolley, who actually was originally supposed to be the male lead in this movie, but considering the actress who was cast as the love interest of the male lead was significantly older than him, he as a make good played the wireless operator of the Carpathia, which, as we know, was the ship that rescued the survivors of the Titanic. And it was the first ship we saw in the movie. Yes, in the TV cut of the movie. So he goes to the captain, and he says, the Titanic, it's sinking. And the captain's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, I'm positive. Captain? Captain, sir, sir, wake up. Come away, come away. Captain, he's only just dropping off. Who is it? First officer Dean, sir. Bloody hell, Dean. Since when you push your way in here without knocking? Sorry, sir, it's an emergency. I don't care a blue damn what it is. I want to see some discipline on this ship. Yes, sir, I'm sorry, sir. Who's that with you? It's Cotton, sir. 
Cut him. Wireless operator, sir. Oh, yes. He's had an urgent communication from the Titanic. The Titanic? Well, what is it? It's the CQD, sir. CQ? Are you sure? Yes, sir. They use the new distress signal as well. SOS. She struck an iceberg. She's uh, 58 miles away. Her course is north, 52 west. Now get back to your men on the Titanic. Tell him we're coming as fast as we can, that we should be there in uh, just under four hours' time. Four hours? You get through all right? Yes, sir. I told him within four hours, just like you said. And what was his reply? He said, please hurry, old man. Engine room flooded. We're sinking head down. Then there was nothing. So they get there. They get to the ice field. And then they see lifeboats. And then they get all the people that are in the lifeboats. We see some of the characters we're going to see in the movie. And uh, oh, Susan St. James in a life vest. Oh, man. <clears throat> well, she looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks good. Looks really good. Looks good. Oh, it looks 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 good. You know what she said as soon as she put on the life vest? Don't say it. Do not say it. Uh oh. Oh, God damn it. He said it. Yeah. But yeah, we meet all of our main characters and also, okay, one surprise survivor they find among the group of survivors is J. Bruce Ismay, the chairman of the White Star Line. And we all know that story. He did not want to go down with his ship. No, he didn't. But playing J. Bruce Ismay is... I would say one of the absolute legends of British cinema, Ian Holm. Yeah, and it's through his eyes that we see this story. Yeah, because he's seeing in the distance. Because someone on the car, baby, he they find him like out in the distance, and he's like, "I see something," and it's like, "Those are all just chairs." Yep. Well, yeah, just chairs which is all that remains of the largest ship in the world. Mr. Ismay, sir, I'm Dr. McGee, ship surgeon. Won't you come inside now, sir, when it's warm, and we can try to make you comfortable. Comfortable? What's the good of standing out here in the cold this way, sir? Look, look. There's something in the water, just there. I don't see anything, sir. Look, look, it's just there. You use your eyes, why don't you? It's only a bit of flotsam, sir. You sure? A few deck chairs by the look of it. That's all. All I can see, sir. A few chairs. All that beauty. All that strength, power, grace. (laughs) Few chairs. So much gaiety. So now God himself couldn't sink. Yeah. So now we go into the beginning of the story proper as we see. J. Bruce Ismay showing some people around the ship, and he runs into John Jacob Astor and his wife. And of course, uh, they're played by David Jansen. And David Jansen, of course, being the fugitive. Dr. Richard Kimball, people! And Beverly Ross, I have no idea who she is. She was not in much. I looked at her IMDb, and nope. This is probably like her only major thing she did. So they're talking to each other. They're marveling at this incredible feat of engineering, which, by the way, a very, very small rudder. And they're not the only ones talking, because, like I said in the pre-production, this is a movie of three different stories. 
The first one, of course, being the historical figures of the White Star Line. And then there's another story between a couple of second-class passengers, namely Lawrence Beasley and Lee Goodwin. Yes. Now, Lawrence Beasley is a real survivor from the Titanic. He was a noted school teacher, and if I'm not mistaken, if I go to Truth by Consensus Wikipedia, a fun fact about him, he's the grandfather of New York Times science editor Nicholas Wade. Yeah, that's something for you. That's but, something for the old trivia banks. Yes. But, okay, playing Lawrence Beasley. Now, this is another legend. Oh, yeah. David Warner. And if you don't know who David Warner is, just... just Why? Don't, don't. Why? Okay, a couple of fun facts. Again, David Warner. Children of the 90s would know him as the British professor on the second Ninja Turtles movie. Oh, yes. Or in a later role as Billy Zane's compare in the 1997 Titanic movie. He's the only actor who's in this SOS Titanic and in the Cameron version of Titanic. Mm-hmm. And also, <laughs> if you if you was in The Big Finish, he's in the Doctor Who series of audio plays over the years, and he's actually played an alternate version of the Doctor in the Doctor Who Unbound series from the early 2000s. Wow. Yeah, so if, if you want to listen to that, go listen to that. It's very good. It is. And the third story. The third story was more of a cautionary tale, because this is how the, the movie began in the TV cut, where somebody was running up to the Carpathian's captain with a CQD and a new distress call, where this movie gets its title, SOS. SOS Titanic, which stands for Save Our Ship. And it sort of kind of bookends, because at the end of the film, you see this whole epilogue about how, if it weren't for this maritime disaster, we would not have all of the safety checks that you would have if you were to, say, go on a cruise ship, and have a cruise vacation, which, by the way, I'm going to do as soon as all of this is over. Right, this is over. You mean the current madness we live in now? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to be sure, yeah. But I'll say this. You have, throughout the whole course of this movie, you have all these premonitions about the ice field and everything, about how everyone's ignoring it. There's and a lot of B-roll on the ice yeah, they oh, yeah. and clearly day for night. You can clearly tell it's like they shot in the day and they put a filter to make it seem like it's nighttime. But yeah. Lawrence Beasley says during the scene to his female love interest, you know what, I've heard stuff about maritime disasters, and I don't know, I don't think this ship is safe at all. Is it the custom to have some sort of lifeboat drill on Sunday? Yes, that's right. Will there be one today? I haven't heard of it. Well, isn't it rather important? I mean, that everyone should know just which boat is assigned to, where it is, and so on? Well, normally I'd say yes, very important. But when you're talking about the Titanic, well, she's one great huge lifeboat herself, ain't she? Put me in my place. Why would you think of lifeboats on a beautiful day like this? I suppose one can't help speculating on the hazards as one puts out to sea. At my hotel in Southampton the day we sailed, I was amazed at the conversations I overheard about famous marine disasters. Everybody's speculating how safe the Titanic really is. That's not creepy. Yeah. Oh, hold on a second. We didn't talk about who plays... Oh yeah, we didn't talk interest. about the cast, did we? Well, we did. have talked about some of the cast, but, but let's not all of the cast. Not all of the cast, but let's get to da who plays David Warner's love interest in the movie. Lee Goodwin, the fictional Lee Goodwin. Yes, who playing her, Amer who is an American school teacher. Yes, in contrast to David Warner, who's British. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this is the second time in four weeks we brought her up on the podcast. Mike, are you ready for this? I'm seated, yes. Susan St. James! Oh, no. McMillan's wife? McMillan's wife. She was either Kate or Allie. 
Yeah. I don't know. I get her confused with Jane Curtin. She's either Kate or Alex. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the gritty reboot of that, by the way. Oh, yeah. That'd be awesome. Unfortunately, they can't. Well, they could use the Ed Sullivan Theater, considering Colbert's not using it these days. True. It could happen. I'm, I'm not banking on it. And going into the rest of the cast, playing the unsinkable Molly Brown. Chico, do you want to have the honors? Cloris Money Flippin' Leachman. And I believe this is the second time we've talked about Cloris Leachman because she was on the Nut House. Oh, yes. We miss you, Cloris. Yeah, we do. I'm surprised this isn't only the second time we've talked about her. Well, it is, unfortunately. But you can never get enough Cloris Leachman on this podcast. You never can. She's our D triples. Yeah. Hey, watch that. <laughs> okay. We have playing Thomas Andrews, who is the shipbuilder of the Titanic. Jeffrey Whitehead, who is a British, practically, that guy from that thing. Yep. A British, that guy from that thing? Yeah. More recently, he was in the TV show Not Going Out, where he played the role of Jeffrey. Oh, wow. A guy named Jeffrey playing the role of Jeffrey. That's not a uh, original. Hey, Mike, it's like you said, it's like Tony Danza playing Tony. He, he He's like the British Tony Danza. You got that right. We assume. But okay. You know how four episodes ago we said, out of everybody, Jennifer Lawrence was the most famous person on this podcast. <laughs> no longer. It's over. It's over. This woman has replaced her as the most famous person we've ever talked about on this podcast. Playing stewardess Mae Sloan. Helen Mirren. And there was just like one scene. One scene Helen Mirren was in. Maybe in the version you watch, but she's in a couple of scenes here or there. Because she plays, I believe, the stewardess to John Jacob Astor in the movie. Yes. You got some high billing uh, on the version I watched. Yeah. She also has the coveted and billing. And Helen Mirren. And funny thing, Helen Mirren in 1979 was in the movie Caligula with Malcolm McDowell. And another funny thing is, another movie Malcolm McDowell was in was Time After Time in 1979. And who played Jack the Ripper in Time After Time? David Warner. Ah. Yes. A classic Time After Time. And if you want to know a funny story about Time After Time... Listen to Malcolm McDowell's appearance on Gilbert Gottfried's Amazing Colossal Podcast. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Oh, playing Daniel Morvin, who's like a director, because he's got like a camera and such with him during the movie, is actually someone we're going to probably be talking about in at least two episodes on this podcast. Jerry Hauser from The Brady Brides. Same voiceover actor, Jerry Hauser? Yes. And the other one we're going to be talking about, because he was a guest spot in the premiere episode of it. Mike, are you ready for this? Lay it on me. The McLean Stevenson Show. Oh, jeez. Yeah. The McLean Stevenson reference this episode. Also in this movie, playing the role of, I'm not making this character's name up, Chief Boots S. Stebbing is David Batley. And you're probably wondering, who is David Batley? Who's David Batley? Well, Chico, would you believe he played Charlie Bucket's teacher in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Charlie Bucket, how many did you open? Two. That's easy. 200 is twice 100. Not 200, just two. Two? What do you mean you only opened two? I don't care very much for chocolate. Well, I can't figure out just two, so let's pretend you open 200. Now, if you open 200 Wonka bars, apart from being dreadfully sick, you'd have used up 20% of 1,000, which is 15% half over again, 10%. Oh, my gosh. Yes! He's in SOS Titanic. And, guys, remember when I said that there'd be another person in the Married for Life episode from Willy Wonka that we'd talk about in this podcast? Guess what? He wasn't the person I was talking about. So there's a third person. 
but you'll have to wait to find that out. One other cast member I want to mention playing an Irish traveler in steerage is Robert Pugh, who plays the character of James Farrell. Now, Robert Pugh is best known today in 2021 for being on Game of Thrones, where he plays the role of Craster, and he was actually in two episodes of Doctor Who from 2010, The Hungry Earth and Cold Blood, where he played the role of Tony Mack. So, let's get into the main beats of the story. So, our first plot is obviously everybody just enjoying their own opulence, as it were. Oh yeah, they're just like in this incredible ship. You have, like, all of the third-class passengers from Ireland. They're all like, oh, my God, we love this ship. Oh, my God, it's so massive. Oh, my God. Yeah, interesting thing. It was Lee Goodwin who briefly, and this is sort of a cross-pollination between plots, Lee Goodwin tells Lawrence Beasley to pursue a person in steerage, but he doesn't want to because ultimately his eyes is going to be on her. Yeah, because she's a teacher like him. Yeah. And they both love books. Yeah, they so, go to the library a lot in this movie. They do. They do a lot of thinking. A lot of communal thinking. That, that's, that's, a, that's a thought, right? Yeah. It is now. Communal thinking. Of course. How Meanwhile, about, about while... Thinking? Sorry, what, Mike. What, what, what was it you said? I said, how about communal thinking? Yeah. I think that's Com- the word you're looking for. Yeah, that's it communal thinking so you have these two who are basically acting as observers to both the upper class in their sort of denial of what's about to happen spoiler alert and the steerage folk who are trying to escape what's gonna happen double spoiler alert and again while they're on the ship they're both having sort of their uh, own ideas of the time of their lives. Oh, yeah. This is about as good as it's ever going to get for them Mm -hmm. on this ship. And meanwhile, on the night of April 15th, or the morning of April 15th, night of April 14th, 1912, well, there is a dramatic scene with uh, very cheap special effects, I should say. A dramatic scene where an iceberg approaches... Titanic closes in, and the only thing you hear somebody say is, well, play the clip. Christ. What did you see? Iceberg right ahead. Thank you. Iceberg right ahead. On the starboard. Yeah, they hit it all right. Yep. Captain Smith talks to Thomas Andrews about the damage that's been done to the ship. And, well, we'll let Thomas Andrews explain it here. Is it hopeless, then? It appears that the unthinkable has happened. As you know, the ship is designed to stay afloat with any three of its first five compartments flooded. It would even float if all five were gone, torn away completely, but... Under no circumstances can she be expected to remain afloat with those five compartments flooded. The sheer weight of the flooding must inevitably bring her down at the head. Every sort of potential damage was considered in the planning. But who could have anticipated a collision that would leave a gash close to 300 feet long in her side? Pumps will help, of course. Temporarily. How much time do you give us? At a rough guess, one hour, possibly two. 
Gentlemen, I must say something to you now, which you can well appreciate is the nightmare of every master, and which in 32 years of service to this company, I never expected to have to say. We must prepare to abandon ship. Yeah, so they're pretty much screwed. One hour, maybe two. One hour, maybe two. Yeah, and you don't have enough lifeboats, so half yeah. the people on board this ship are going to die. They're going to die. They're going to die! It's like a real-life Royal Rumble before the Royal Rumble was invented. Every man for him, every Well, every man, woman, and child for himself, for themselves in this case. So, basically, what the staff is trying to do before everybody, you know, dies is get whoever is in the vicinity to come quickly. Get into these lifeboats. Let's just get out of here. Let's get out of this ship that's sinking. And some people are in, like, in complete denial that the ship is sinking. There's, like, the one scene where there's, like, the four people that are playing that poker game. Yep. They're just, like, playing the poker game. It's like, they don't care. They don't care that the ship is sinking. They just want to get on with their poker game. And, of course, it isn't until the porter knocks on everybody's doors and says, All passengers on deck with the life the song that... Everybody starts to sort of get the picture. Oh, my God. And then the maid in steerage was like, you have nothing to worry about. Just go back to bed like, lady, do you even know what's going on right now? Yeah, this ship is sinking. This ship is sinking. This is the largest man-made object in the planet, and it's sinking. It's made of iron. It's made of it's iron. It's going to sink. It's going to sink. By the way, there's that one scene in the movie where there's the, the third class passengers. They're throwing the ice from that hit the ice. They're like event. snowballs. They're like snowball fighting on the ship. Mike, if a ship hit an iceberg, the last thing you'd want to do is fry have a snowball fight, right? That actually sounds kind of fun. Oh, come on. I know I'm not helping, but... <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> no. Meanwhile, in second class, people are wondering, A, how is it that life vests work? And B, why are people playing in the gym? I don't know. It must be a fancy gym. It is a fancy gym. Yeah. At least by 1912 standards. Yeah. And again, more cheap special effects. Here comes the flares. Flares. She. And the wireless operators are frantically trying to get somebody to find them, anybody. Hey, let's save ourselves. Please. Get here. I'm miming a teletype from, like, 1912, the wireless. And these jokers are still playing poker. Or whatever it is they're playing. I'm pretty sure it's not poker. Maybe it's bridge. I don't know. Yeah, one thing I notice is that everybody seems very calm about it. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Uh, ship's this ship's sinking. sinking. We're probably all going to die. Whatever. Put your life vests on and shut up. But not Molly Brown. No, because Chorus Leachman don't take no from anybody. Nope. Yeah, she wants to know what's going on and where's everybody going. And why is there a band playing? Yeah. A oh, moving band's playing. A moving band that's playing. Now you know you're in first class, by the way. Yeah. Actually, one principal difference of this film with other film versions, rather than the sacred Nearer My God to Thee, which the ship's band plays, they just use secular ragtime tunes. Which, why? Again, I, maybe, they were, might, maybe they wanted to make this a sort of Maybe they wanted to make it the happy version of the Titanic sinking. Hmm. I didn't oh. know there was a not happy version of the Titanic singing. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. The happy version of the Titanic is clearly that animated movie with the rapping dog. You know, there's something you should know, so I'm gonna tell you so. Don't sweat it. Forget it. Enjoy the show. Working all day, now it's time to unwind. Kick back, relax, take a load off your mind. <laughs> I'll be busting the moves and I'll be busting the rhymes. We'll be busting up laughing because it's party time. Everybody's feeling fine, cause it's party time. Party time, it's party time. Everybody's feeling fine, cause it's party time. Party time, it's party time. Everybody's feeling fine, cause it's party time. Party time, party time. Everybody's feeling fine, cause it's party time. Party time, it's party time. Everybody's feeling fine, cause it's party time. Shut up! Make it stop. 
stop. Man, if only Sam Beckett were here to save everybody on the Titanic. Yeah, the Quantum Leap Accelerator doesn't go that far back. We've established this. Oh, yeah, because he can only go back to when he was born. Yeah. What, unless he had a relative that was on the Titanic. That's another story. But then what else happens? Everybody's loading the lifeboats, and Molly's like, what are you girls doing? Everybody get in the boats. Everybody get in the boats. I'm Cloris Leachman. And then the guy forces her into the boats, and, well... Obviously, we know the uh, story of the unsinkable Molly Brown because made even more unsinkable by Chloris freaking Leachman. Damn straight. Ship is sinking, and it's just like, oh, it's... Oh, oh, there's also a scene where the third-class passengers are trying to get through in the first-class dining room. Of course they are. And they're trying to get through the first-class dining room, but one of the people that's guarding is like, Oh, you can't get past the dining room because you you don't belong here. You're third class. But they're like, well, at least let the women go through. And then the person guarding the room's like, yeah, you're right. And he just Bri- lets the women British, go through. British chivalry demands it. British chivalry it. demands it. And there's like, okay, okay, you ladies, you can go on through. Meanwhile, we have perhaps some of the best stunt work in the film where all of the men are trying to jump into the lifeboat. Jump, 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 jump. Including what looks to be one Jay Bruce as May. Oh, yeah. He gets into the lifeboat. And Captain Smith just looks at, at Bruce as May like, You son of a bitch. He's... And the security are loading up their guns. Because apparently that was a thing in 1912. Well, if anyone tried to get on the boat, if they weren't supposed to be on it, someone had to give some order. Yep. Some proper British order. Yeah. Meanwhile, as the Titanic continues to sink, we have everybody is still being very laissez-faire about it. I didn't know it was a party! We have one of the Strausses just getting really angry as to why he's not in one of the boats and why the boats are getting lowered prematurely. And he does the whole, do you know who I am sort of thing? Yeah, I own Macy's. I own Macy's, damn it. And it turns out he just crumbles. Yeah. Well, at least him and his wife, they're going to die together on the boat. Oh, yeah. But not Susan St. James, because she gets on the boat. Oh, she gets on the lifeboat, yeah. They're stuck like, on like, the but you knew, But you knew she was going to get on the lifeboat, because... We saw her in the beginning of the of, of the TV version. Yes. We saw her getting off the boat. Meanwhile, in steerage, we have a bunch of crying children. Yeah. Uh... This is not a good look. No. Well, it got real, folks. Yep, like, men stay back, women and children, everybody, women and children up on deck. But it was clear that they were screwed. Yeah. It's like they were being led up to deck. There's no one on deck. What's there to do but play snowballs with the ice? Except the guys were like, no, nah, no, nah, man, screw that mess. We're going up on deck. We're going to get into those lifeboats. We're going to get into those boats. But as it would happen, everybody was locked in. Oh. But apparently, because it's a TV production, it doesn't stand a chance against the weight of a very heavy Irishman. They take time out from their dying to admire just how grandiose the uh, dining room is. Yeah, that's the scene I talked about earlier. Yeah. So let's get back to uh, the Astors trying to... Wait, uh, wait, wait. We're, we're, we're dying. We need to to enjoy the spectacle that's known as the dining room. Yes. Well, they're poor. They Remember, have... they're poor. they poor. These Irish people that are in third class are poor. They have never seen a dining room this fancy before. They have a Titanic cake. Yeah. Remember, one of the girls on this boat going on the Titanic has never had dinner in her life. She actually said that. It's an abandoned ship for a run for your life, but what is it at all? It's lunch. Do you make that racket every time it's lunch, then? And breakfast and dinner. Third class dining saloon once again, thank you. Dinner? They call tea dinner. What swank? I never had dinner in my life. We're on our way to ruin the bunch of us. 
Because apparently, I guess in Britain, I guess dinner is tea, right? Oh, we're going to get letters from British people. I should have someone, at least from the UK, explain what the difference is between tea and dinner. Okay, so place to be nation's Cal McDougal explained to me that in northern England, they will call their dinner tea, whereas in southern England, they will call it dinner. However, in Scotland, it is not uncommon to hear people call their lunch, quote-unquote, dinner, and their dinner, quote-unquote, tea. But for the most part, it's just a different way of saying the same thing, referring to their evening meal. Thank you, Callum. Also, you get it if you've ever seen Lord of the Rings. And that little kid has to leave his toy behind, which one of the staffers just steps on. Like, yeah. it's no big deal. Like, it's nothing. Like, you want to leave this toy? Well, screw you. I'm just going to step on it. We're all dying. Who cares? And then there's another day for night shot. So much day for night in this movie. And then we get to the third plot, which was the telegraph room. Yeah. Yeah. Not many people know that this was probably the uh, sort of bookend of the movie. The reason why we're making this movie in the first place was to talk about the messages. So while the messages are going out, the men of third class are pretty much storming the grand foyer, and anybody who's still in third class right now is about to drown. And the band's just playing as everybody's rushing up for a lifeboat or a life jacket, a wooden door or something. Could you imagine the band playing and that rapping dog with that boombox comes? Oh, God. Stop it! And by the way, we see that everybody's just going diagonal. There's no real pitch or roll to it because this was made in 1979 and we didn't know all we knew about the uh, Titanic sinking that we do now. Yeah, because in this version there's, of the... There's no list. If you look at the film, there's no list being portrayed. Yeah, and also, the ship doesn't break apart. It wasn't common knowledge to everybody that the ship broke apart while it was sinking. It sank as one piece. And of course, one of the people looking out from the lifeboats is Lawrence Beasley, because yeah. we all know he survives. Yeah, as we saw in the beginning of the movie. So Lawrence Beasley and Lee Goodwin both survive. Yeah. Do they find each other on the Carpathia? Yeah, they do find each other on the Carpathia. It's okay, waiting. the moment. Okay. Let's... There's Titanic, big ass in the air. Now, if this was 1997, we'd see the power flicker and the ship split into two. Yeah. And you'd see Leo and Kate, they'd be hanging on to, like, the top of the bow. As yeah. it was sinking. But no, not in this version. Nope. Whole thing goes under. Whole thing goes under. Nose dives even. Nose dives even. So you can tell that this movie was pretty much dated. There's no breakage into two or three, depending on what time this was airing in. And there's no list. Because there's also a notable list. Oh yeah, because they had to take names, right? No, I, I, when I say list, I mean... The ship was leaning to one side. Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about the scene in, near the end of the Titanic movie when, when they're trying to get all the names in the 97 movie. And then it's gone. It's gone. Everybody's commiserating. Well, people who are crying in their boats are swimming for something. And everybody was like, we could take more out of the water. We took everybody we could. Yeah. What's the, well. what's the use of any more dying? As if no use to anyone. There's nothing more we can do for them. We took all we could out of the water. We'll get swamped if we go back. What's the use in any more dying? That's no help to anyone. And there's the doll! Oh my god! Now I'm sad. Oh. Quick cut to the next day, where we are back on the Carpathia. Yeah, Jay Bruce is meh. He's like, he's just all commiserating. Yeah. And then we have, like, Lawrence Beasley and Lee Goodwin reunited on the Carpathia. Obviously, they're not going to end up together. Otherwise, we would have heard about it. Yeah. And besides, Susan St. James' character is fictional anyway, so. Yeah. But everybody was looking at Jay Bruce is 
Like, you mother. Like, you son of a bitch. Mike, if you saw Jay Bruce is May, what would you think? I'd be like, hey, Jay Bruce, you were a pretty good player for the Cincinnati Reds back in the day. Oh, wrong Jay Bruce. I'm sorry. Bet you never thought you'd hear a Jay Bruce reference on this podcast. Hey, expect the unexpected around here. That's what we do. Meanwhile, Lee and Lawrence, they're back together. And they notice that nobody's screaming or sobbing. It was very much quiet. Yeah. It hasn't hit them, but don't yeah. worry, it will. Well, we get into the last scene of the movie where Mrs. Astor is with a bunch of people that just lost their husbands, too. And we'll, we'll just play the clip right here. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies. I'm Mrs. Ogden from New York. I'm just one of the passengers on the Carpathia trying to do my bit. I got hot coffee here and sandwiches, huh? Oh, now, come on. You've got to have some nourishment after all. Come on, dear, you set them an example. Please don't do that. Just give it to somebody else, won't you, please? Every one of these ladies has just lost her husband. I know that, son. I know how I'd feel in their place. And believe me, my heart goes out to you, all of you. But you've got to go on living. You just have to say to yourself it was God's will. Whatever you do, you must never lose faith in the infinite wisdom and mercy of the Lord. Coffee. Hmm? No coffee. No God, either. God went down with the Titanic. Like I said, there was an epilogue here, and I will uh, cue up the epilogue and read it to you. Okay. The Titanic sank with 2,220 passengers and crew, 1,517 perished, 703 survived. And this is all part of the credits, by the way. Oh, yeah. This is a great part about the credits. They have the people that died first. In uh-huh. alphabetical order. And then they have the people that were saved at the bottom. That is fantastic. Yeah, Jay Bruce no, no, says, wait, hey, that son of a bitch. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, now, I, if you want to cut this, you can. I, I got to ask, you, you had the survivors uh, at the bottom and you had the, the people who perished on top? Yeah. Shouldn't it be the other way around? The, the people who didn't survive should be at the bottom? Sort of like real life, tee hee. I'm oh, sorry. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I, 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 I'm going to my room. You go to your room and think about what you've done, Mike. Yeah, uh, Mike. I, I, I need to go to my new bedroom and and think about for a hard, long, hard time. Yes, yes, you do. Yeah. Well, I was remembering that there was a more extensive sort of crawl in the theatrical yeah. cut that was syndicated all over the world. Yeah. Explaining how this tragedy gave rise to many of the maritime safety measures that are actually on ships nowadays. Yeah, because as we mentioned, this was released theatrically in England. But we didn't get this here theatrically, obviously, because they aired it as a TV movie here. Yeah, all of that sort of thing is best illustrated in the beginning of the film, which if you have a chance to get it on DVD, please do so. Yes, because last year, actually last October, they released this on a special edition DVD and Blu-ray from Kino Warber, which has the theatrical edition, but for the first time commercially available, they released the TV cut of the movie which is why we decided to put this on this podcast on April. Okay. But Chico, you talked about how this would air in syndication at many points over the years. Yes, it would. That's the first one I saw growing up. Yes. The theatrical cut. Well, so one station in Wichita, Kansas, K S A S Fox 24, the Fox affiliate in Wichita, Kansas actually made a hilarious promo promoting this movie in the noon time slot on Sunday one afternoon. Tell and me wh- you're going to play it. 
Tell me you're going to play it. Well, we're going to play it right here. Before there was the mega money-making motion picture blockbuster Titanic, there was S.O.S. Titanic. The same disaster, minus the four special effects. The same ship, without the million-dollar designs. So much for the smoking room and the palm court. And the same characters. Sorry, ladies. No Leonardo. But hey, there's this guy. <laughs> Watch S.O.S. Titanic, Sunday, noon on Fox 24. S.O.S. Titanic. Titanic, S.O.S. Titanic. There's really no big difference. I, I mean, the ship still sinks. There you go. <laughs> ah, ah. Oh my gosh, that was great. No difference. The ship still sinks. Brings a tear to your eye. It does, doesn't it? That was glorious. That was well, just ah, yeah. Chef's kiss. Chef's kiss, baby. You got that right. One more thing I want to note is actually, if you want to get the soundtrack to this movie. It is actually available on iTunes. If you search SOS Titanic original film soundtrack, you'll find the soundtrack by the composer Howard Blake, and you'll get at least 30 tracks on there. So you can download that, and I presume you can also download the album off of Amazon Music as well as iTunes. And looking it over, you can get the SOS Titanic album to buy on Amazon Music. It is available for $9.49. And you could also stream it if you have a subscription to Amazon Music Unlimited. Well, guys, what can we say about SOS Titanic? Before it was a thing at the movies in Europe, which became a thing in syndication. In 1979, it was a thing on TV. But guys, we're not done. No. Oh, no, we're not. We're not. No. Guys, it's time to play eBay Price is Right. Damn you! Oh, no. What did he find? I don't want to... You know, uh, I'm going to find out anyway. I want it's Haiku like... Corner back. <laughs> well, we're going to do Haiku Corner at the end, but before we do that... Okay, guys, you are bidding on a Titanic model, and now this is one two hundredth scale of the RMS Titanic Revel Minicraft Pro Built, and let me read this description. A one twenty scale RMS Titanic Pro model Built. This model is over 50 inches long and is nothing short of breathtaking. Museum quality, hands down. This particular model was built for another client, so if you're interested in having one for yourself, contact me. This model can also be seen on Craigslist Seattle. No low bowlers. This model is worth every penny of the asking. If you want cheap, there is plenty of imported stuff on eBay here, and this would be better for you. Thank you for looking. Wow, just hit me in the gut, why don't you? And I'm going to send you the model in the Facebook chat of the picture. That's pretty decent looking. Yeah. That's a 1 in 20, so you could use that for, I don't know, a uh, a school production of Titanic, but not a theatrical. No, maybe a student film. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. We could have that sitting in my school. That would be a nice little introduction piece. Maybe not as to you know how to build a ship. Maybe you know less like, than you know, how like to build a ship. Yeah, I could I could see it right now. Titanic, the world's greatest maritime disaster, until the folks at Costa screwed up with the Concordia. Oh yeah. For more about that, visit Jake Williams abandoned about that. But okay. This is the buy it now price on the item. So okay. we're going to start the bidding with Chico. I'm going to bid $75. $75, Mike. No real reason. Just throwing okay. a number out there. Chico, I think the world of you, that is not a $75 piece. I'm not going to just do $75 or one. I'm not going to do $76, but I legitimately think that Given all the detail and, and the, the craftsmanship and the materials used, I'm going to give you a wide berth here. I'm going to say $199. Guys? Don't say we overbid. 
Do you want to know the price of this? Are you ready for this? Oh, it's more than 199. I was going to go to like it 500. Is gonna... What is oh. it? Mike, do you want? All right. Okay. Wait, okay. So, so let's, okay. Okay. Let's get this out of the way. I won. You won. Uh, but we're now okay. we're, 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 we're now actually... over 500. So take a guess. Take a guess. At over, it's over 500. 750. Now Mike's bidding. Okay. No, it's four and a half feet long. And again, with that detail, I would say it's probably about $1,200. Here it is. Are you ready for the price? $3,000. Shut up. And do you want to know how much it is to ship this? Oh, it's got to be at least probably about $300. It is $300. Oh. You oh got it goodness. on the nose, Mike. Oh my. This is $3,300. Shut up. I mean, it's beautiful, but I mean, you really need it to be. It is so time, beautiful. You really need to be a big time Titanic fan to, to excuse the phrase that this is not uh, intended. You need to be a real big Titanic fan to sink that much money into that. Yeah. You know what you could sink your time into, though? Our website. It was a thing on TV.com. Yes. We can find everything. You can find all of our past live shows. You can find all our mini sets, our regular episodes, the director's cuts. And as you noticed last Sunday, we're starting a series of shows where we're going to go back into the archives and remaster. Because in the beginning, before we really cared about the audio quality, me and Chico's audio levels on some of the early episodes are absolutely terrible. So we are starting to fix the early episodes up to episode 20. We're not doing episode one. Cause I believe Mike, you already did that with episode one a while back. Yeah. I, I did a little bit of an update and that we're not talking about episode hundred, but yeah, there is a new version or a newer version. I uploaded sometime. I think last summer. Yeah. So we're not worried about episode one. So, up to episodes 2 through 20 before I got a better headset. Thank you, Justin Rosero, by the way. We are going to go into the archives. We started with Mr. Smith, and coming this coming Sunday, we're going to revisit in the remastered version. Say it, Mike. No, I want you to say it. Auto Man and Manimal. Zippers! Zippers! Zippers? Oh, you weren't here for that. No, I wasn't here for that. Zipper. Oh, you got to listen to it. I'll yes. listen to if it. If you've never listened to episode three, I think it's probably like one of the greatest moments in the history of the podcast. Yes. When we go through the episodes of Auto Man and we hit the episode, it, it's called Zippers. It is literally called Zippers. And, 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 and that was my reaction. It's like, Zippers? That's like absolutely ridiculous. But then we get into the logistics of everything because what Zippers is is a male strip club and Auto Man goes undercover as a male stripper, which really, if you think about it, he doesn't really have much there because, you know, he's like half cyborg and half person. And and we really get into, or at least I get into, when he strips, I mean, he's not wearing like underwear or anything it's like this blue gel the, the same color as like aqua fresh and not aqua fresh but uh what, what are that sparkly toothpaste from like 30 years ago? crest crest for kids crest? yeah crest. if you remember like that color the crest man was in those ads that's I do like remember the color, that. that that's like the color and, and actually uh the, the texture of how auto man's girth his his, his manhood body. Well, for lack of it, it was more than his, his, his uh, cybernetic manhood. It, it was more than his manhood, but basically everything when he had his pants off was crest toothpaste, sparkly blue. Yeah. yeah. And now you have been spoiled on episode three. But it is an enjoyable episode three. And Mike, still one day. I'm going to own that picture of Simon McCorkendale and his Falcon. And, and, and you're going to hang that in the museum. That may be actually something McLean Stevenson will actually hold in his hands. <laughs> the pic- yeah. He'll hold it in his hand, the picture of Simon McCoy. Hey, I got a great, better idea. How about next to the giant statue of McLean Stevenson, we have a giant statue of Simon McCoy and Dale and his falcon. 
a real falcon or a statue falcon? A statue falcon hanging on his arm. I, I think a real falcon would be like amazing, but I like your idea too. Yeah. yeah. It's like remember oh. that remember that giant monument of Superman with the eagle on his hand? Remember that, Chico? I do. Yeah, that's it's gonna kind of be like that. A giant monument of Simon McQuarkendale with a falcon on his arm. It's going to be epic. Yeah. And also you can go to Place to Be Nation Pop Experience and listen to our weekly Wednesday drafts, which, by the way, right now, you can check 151 and 152, which is The Nerd and The Amazing Screw on Head. And, well, what more can we add about The Nerd? I can't think of anything. Can you? It needed more tambourine. It needed more tambourine and more of Robert Joy dancing. Yep. And also, do not forget to hit up our social medias, especially our YouTubes, where you can like, comment, and subscribe to our feed. And don't forget to ring the bell. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, I'm going to find an air horn, like a boat horn. That'll work. You know what? That works. Yeah. It's thematic, yes. Yes, it okay. is thematic. Okay. All right. So what do we have on tap next week? Next week, we're back into pilot month. With uh, one entry that, that at, at least Greg and I can relate to because it has the tin dog in it. And not only that, but it has maybe one of the most bizarre WTF opening sequences of all time. It's very 80s. It's very early 80s and very what in the world is this? But you know what? We're going to take another detour from Pilot Month, but we're going to continue on the theme of the first episode. Considering pretty soon we're going to have the Academy Awards. And so for award season, we figured we're going to go back and cover a classic award show. But in true, it was a thing on TV fashion. It's not going to be your run-of-the-mill award show. And it's not going to be your run of the wheel award show moment either. No. And everybody knows the moment. Everybody knows the moment. But you don't know the entire event itself. You don't know the story behind the moment. You don't know the story behind the moment. And let's just say it's going to be amazing. And you know what? I think it's going to be a long, long time. Till we get to that episode, but you know what? It's going to be epic. And you know what else is epic? It what? was a thing on TV Haiku Corner. Oh, no. Well, folks, are you ready for this? Let's do this. All right. Are you ready, Mike? Oh, I'm ready. Okay, here we go. Titanic Hitsburg. Susan St. James reacted? Her response? Uh-oh. George! Oh, God. And with that, we'll just leave you to think on that one until our next thing on TV. Thanks for listening. Have a great weekend, everyone. Wow! It seems like uh, celebrities are, are everywhere, and, and thank God, our, uh, one of our stage managers, Biff Henderson, he does a little segment on... Here's Biff. Take a, take a bow, Biff. Come on, take a bow. Here he is right there. He, Biff, Biff does this... Uh... Biff does a, uh... a little segment of the show that is called the Biff Henderson Celebrity Interview, and you got one again for us tonight, right, Biff? Yes, I so do. Who is it do you talk to tonight? Uh, Leon, Leon, Leonardo. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Leonardo <laughs> DiCaprio. Yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, so here it is. The Biff Henderson Celebrity Interview. Take a look. Leonardo DiCaprio. Thank you for joining me tonight. Tell me, do you have any funny stories from making of Titanic? Uh-huh. <laughs> How much? Five gallons? <laughs> Katie, bar the door. <laughs> what did you do? Blow it up real bad? <laughs> okay, okay. I'll see you later. <laughs>
Man, man, that crazy bastard is lucky to be alive. <laughs> Jeff Henderson, ladies and gentlemen, had a boy this.